Thank you. So it's, um, it's great here to be here today at the first uh, ever Great British Node Conference. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what it's like being a Node.js developer and working with a team of Node.js developers. Um, firstly, Node on a hat is pretty cool. Um, not many other language platforms allow you to write websites for a living and also run it on your hat. So on the hat I've got how many Twitter follows that the hat's currently got, the CPU load, the showing up here, and if you want to know more about it, I'll, um, I'll show you that. So who am I? I'm Paul Serby from Clock. I'm the CTO of Clock. Uh, I've been at Clock for 12 years. We uh, clock, uh, people come to us for ideas and to build things, but basically that means um, we make websites for people. Uh, we work with lots of publishers, uh, so we're used to working um, on tight deadlines for national publishers for magazines and papers and television uh, where the product, product has to be delivered quickly and has to scale well. Uh, so I'm interested actually to know how many people here are coders. So can you put your hand up, keep your hand up if you're a coder? So I think that's pretty much everyone here is a coder. But keep your hand up if you code for a living. And if you write JavaScript for a living. And if you write Node.js for a living. Woo! <laughs> nice, that's really good. So there's a vast majority of people here who do write Node. So um, I'm gonna share some of the experiences we've had at Clock and It'll be a bit of therapy session for me because I spend a lot of time, I'm a real fanboy as you can tell because I have a hat with Node.js on it. I love Node.js. I spend a lot of time talking about how well it serves us, uh, but it's not all plain sailing. And over the uh, nearly three years of using Node.js, there has been a few problems. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, our experiences with that. So why Node? Um, we've been running for 16 years and we were getting on just about fine delivering projects. Uh, 10 years of doing PHP. PHP uh, was a great platform for doing the sort of things we do. Um, but we've been waiting for three years and if, uh, maybe many of you come from a uh, PHP background and it was getting a bit frustrating in the uh, community. We waited three, three years, I think, for 5.3 to come out as version six and it just wasn't happening and the community was stagnating a little bit. Um, also, at the same time, version two of the framework, so Symphony and Zend, Coding Knight, all had new frameworks coming out. So uh, on the older frameworks, you had to really uh, probably start thinking about changing the way you develop. So it coincided. So while we were looking at PHP frameworks, we also had a little look at what Node could offer us. And blocking I.O. was our constant bottleneck. That was the main thing that we always used to struggle with at scale. It was always that uh, an Apache process would be waiting to read from a database, a TCP connection from disk, from some sort of I.O., and that would mean we'd have to put a lot more infrastructure than we really felt was necessary. So the non-blocking event loop seemed like an attractive idea. And ba just being bored of PHP, we'd sort of done PHP for a long time. We knew the tools, we had the processes in place, and it, it worked well, but... Uh, myself and the development team you know wanted to try something else so we, we took it a bit of a a bit of a gamble really with node.js it, it has to be said uh, early on we decided to have a look at it start to develop a couple of little applications and some modules and uh, replace our uh, previous cms that we had in php um, and start writing projects for clients so we needed a, cl a client who was willing to firstly let us um, experiment on them really and was suited to this type of development and fortunately we we did a few small projects but the first big project of national sort of scale was a project for the sun and it was a loyalty platform um, to that led up to Christmas and basically allowed you to get a turkey for Christmas uh, I think that was the main reason that people went on there um, and this was a great uh, test bed for doing no, node JS uh, for developing in node.js So um, it wasn't massive, it was a good sized project to start with. It ran for three months, uh, had 150,000 registrations and it peaked at around about 250 entries per second. And it performed really well, far less infrastructure than we've ever, we would, uh, would have put with our PHP stack. Uh, and from a business point of view, it came in as a very profitable project. Uh, our average at clock is around about 30 to 40 percent, that's what we sort of look for to determine whether a project's been successful. Um, and it definitely did that. It was actually slightly more, better than we expected. That doesn't necessarily mean that Node was, was 
completely, uh, it was a, it's a project to do very up and down, so it wasn't just down to node, but what is good about this stat is that it wasn't zero, and that was, our, that was what we worried about. We, we made a big, we had to commit to the business that we were going to develop in node, and it could have been a big fat zero, and we would have looked pretty bad, and we'd still be doing PHP now. So it kind of it passed the first test. Uh, so during this project, it, it went pretty well, but there was some pain. Um, you may have experienced this. If you ever find yourself going, why is my, get, pull, pulling down master if you work in a team or merging master, and then you run your tests and they don't run or they don't work, and you can't work out what it is. Uh, the, the common thing, I don't know if anyone has ever done this, do you ever go RM hyphen RF node modules npm install? Do you know that? Yeah, that happens, doesn't it? You just can't work out, nothing's really changed. You think I'll just ditch all my NPM modules and start again. So version mismatching in NPM, that was probably the only pain, or main pain point we experienced during this project. And uh, the solution that, that we uh, sort of was right widely adopted there was to chuck all, all of your NPM packages into Git. And Michael Rogers has an article which kind of set, uh, defines the tone at the time of how, or the, the method that you should use. And then all you had to do was NPM uh, rebuild once you checked out your project and you'd have the you'd have the NPM modules in the exact state that your the rest of your colleagues have uh, because not only can it just be disruptive to your developer workflow worse than that it can mean that you go to deploy fortunately we could deploy to staging before we go to live but you can deploy to staging and the version that you had in a development machine may have just changed in a, a few minutes later the next version um, of a module of a sub module will come out and that will completely break the build Subsequently, uh, checking into Git does work, and there are some use cases where you still may want to do that. But the the more uh, preferred what we do now because it makes your Git history very noisy. If you're check checking in all your modules constantly, every time you do an update, you get a lot of commits that you're not really interested in. So npm shrink wrap, and I would if you're not already doing this, I would really implore you to add this to your developer workflow. It saves a lot of headaches um, from teams going, "Why my unit tests are not working?" and um, RM hyphen RF node modules. Uh, you just install, and then if you do install save, and then uh, install save and shrink wrap, and then commit that whole thing in, it means that everybody on your team will be getting the right versions, and then you can, you can then decide, and it's determinable when you upgrade your packages, and when you upgrade your packages, you can just recommit your shrink wrap. So this approach works well, um, and we no, no longer keep all of our dependencies in Git. One thing to mention on this, this is this semantic versioning. We were, I wasn't really, you know, version, there's a number of versioning systems. We switched to all of our versions to be as in line with semantic versioning, and, and we still get it wrong occasionally, and so do many uh, module authors. That, that you, you learn which module authors you can trust and start to be a bit fuzzy with their versioning, but it should be major, minor patch, and that's that major. You only incre you increment major if you make incompat any incompatible a API changes. Minor if you add a backwards compatible feature, and the patch if you're fixing bug fixing bugs. So npm works a lot better if your module authors uh, are do using semantic version incorrectly, and many of them do. Even though I know about this, I still occasionally. Uh, accidentally increase a minor version when I should only be doing, I uh, should, should be increasing a major version. So just be aware of that. And if you're authoring or your team's authoring, make sure that they are fully aware that that's the best way to be making sure MKM works correctly. You still can't avoid M shrink wrap. That is, you know, you need that for the protection. But that just means that you can, be a li you can be a little bit safer when you're upgrading your packages and you've got fuzzy matches in your MPM package.json. So, Another piece of another pain that we encountered was how do you build big applications? And big applications doesn't necessarily mean scalable applications. It means big applications that the whole team can work on at the same time and collaborate. And um, Substack um, coined the Substack pattern, and it's, it's, it works well. It's a fundamental design approach uh, which is inherent in the language. And it really is just good software design. It's functional cohesion. It's the best type of real cohesion you have. And if you're JavaScript developers coming from JavaScript land, it's really the other, it's a, you're the other, it's co coincidental um, cohesion. You've just got these massive 
uh, work uh, tool belts which do everything, it just couples everything together. We're talking about the complete change around to the way we write JavaScript, making everything small modules and bringing them together. So it's interesting at clock, when we did PHP, the only way to tame this big PHP, and it was becoming like Java, it was much more object orientated, big systems, lots of interfaces and very deep um, call stacks uh, of interfaces after interfaces, uh, especially if you're trying to write good cohesive code, uh, lots of small uh, JavaScript, uh, sorry, PHP. But what we saw is from switching from 2010 to where we are now, pretty much everyone's dumped their IDE and everybody is using text editors like Vim and Sublime or TextMate. So, but with the focus on quality is greater than it was before, we became a little bit lazy and reliant on our IDEs perhaps. I'm not saying IDEs are a bad thing, I'm not saying that the tools that we have to develop JavaScript to as good as they could be, but it made making sure you have the unit tests to cover the um, scenarios and where your code should be working, knowing the API, making code and your projects in, out of lots of little pieces of code which you can fully understand so you can go in and look at it and understand it. That's a much better approach and there could be hundreds of these pieces but if each one works individually, you know, bringing them together, a lot of what you're doing as a developer is just wiring up uh, projects. So I would say a lesson learned here is, and we definitely didn't do this to start with, we, we went our p old PHP ways and one, wanted a monolith and looked at, uh, for a big framework, but that just wasn't the right approach. So craft your applications by combining a selection of modules. Learn which module authors to trust and bring in their modules and check out what mod new modules are becoming available. Um, and build as many applications as you need. We fell foul of this, and I think probably Express is a little bit to blame in this place, where we, our web server, it was a web server, but it was also a CSS compiler and a JavaScript compiler, and we had a message queue in there, and it was dispatching emails, and it was even doing cron-like jobs, all within our single Express applications, which might seem crazy, but that's just sort of the way it, it built up. We're used to having an app, one application, and it's certainly not a great way to build software. Um, and if you are going to split your application up into lots of little applications, then make sure that they can all talk to, uh, talk to each other. So with that design approach, two years later, and a, a, bit of, a large amount of technical debts to repay all the things where we built two bigger pieces of software, we've pretty much got this architecture for most of our solutions now. And starting at the bottom, third-party modules, so modules that we need to do things, Project modules, so these may be maybe a Salesforce integration which is custom to a particular client but does not, is not actually a uh, direct uh, business requirement for the customer. And then all of our domain services and our domain models sit within NPM packages. And then on top of that, we run a number of um, applications. So the, and these applications all uh, pull in, or mostly pull in the uh, packages on the bottom layer. So we have a REST API and we have a CSS admin which talks to REST API, the website which talks to REST API and potentially to the modules directly. Workers which do things like send emails uh, because it's, it doesn't make sense to have email sending or anything other than, it's, you know, you've got lots of people coming to your website. The last thing you want to do is trying to send an email, the template's invalid, the, the web server crashes and you, all the other people who are going to be served by that web, that web process um, you know, they lose their connection. So making the website as uh, stable as possible and getting all of the other pieces of work uh, in separate little applications. And this makes it easier to manage your project and your code, but it also gives you a great base for scalability. So up at the top we have a load balancer, and the dream was to have a purely p node stack. And I know some people have achieved a, a pure node stack. We have, a, you know, we have a lot of experience with using Varnish and various CDNs um, and we've just kept our load balancer and our proxy layer up at the top as a Varnish layer. Um, it works really well, it's quite naive, we just, the developers say what the HTTP uh, behaviour should be and then the load balancer generally uh, does what it's told, so that's the one part of our stack which isn't a uh, node. And then again at the bottom, we're using 0MQ for our message bus um, at the bottom to, to allow everything to communicate. It's wrapped up in a node wrapper, but it is still 0MQ. I'd like that to be node, it should be node. Uh, it's definitely something that's on our list of things to upgrade and change, but it worked so well and it was so easy and we had experience with it that it just didn't need to be um, refactored and it doesn't give us any cause of 
to any problem, so we continue to use it. But a distributed message bus between applications would definitely be a better approach for that bottom layer. So using that, we have now been rolling out powerful websites for publishers, never underdressed, which is by the guys who did uh, do the shortlist and stylist magazines, the ones that you get on the tube on a Thursday and uh, Wednesday. And this was their first digital glossy, it's all powered by Node. It's a powerful publishing platform with a, uh, a publishing backend all uh, written again in JavaScript. We're using Backbone as our um, front end library, but it's, the system's built explicitly for building responsive sites and streamlines to publishers' workflows. We've been working with publishers for many years, and we understand the workflows and what their teams need to do and try to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, Sunday World as well, uh, Ireland is one of Ireland's biggest tabloid papers. Um, this was rolled out in June on a similar architecture and platform. And then it's come full circle again. And we have now rolled out the permanent version of the Sun Perks for the Sun. So this went, when they went behind paywall, this was a large part of that. And then that, News International are very good. They're really into uh, us using new technologies. They have a good node um, team internally as well. So. Uh, it's a great client to work with because it allows us to build things which has got, we've got lots of integration and just leverage the power of Node really. So coming round a year or two years later, so the second Sun Perch project, how does it compare to the first? We're still profitable. Not that it, we, what we did I think with the previous project is we got a lot done but there was a lot of technical debt to repay. This technical debt, we've, we've put our processes in place, we do a little bit more work up front. We account for things that uh, may cause us uh, problems down the line and we do things a little bit more uh, process driven and we found our feet a little bit, I think, more with Node. So not as profitable, but still that generally our project's coming out at that kind of level of profit. So Node.js is still serving us well. Um, but with this comes a new, uh, some new pain points and perhaps the biggest one really, or the, uh, the one that we had to do something about is that NPM isn't always available, it can be slow, but it's, you know, it's a free service, it works extremely well, it's, not, it's generally very reliable, but when you become very dependent on it for your builds and your deployments, that can be a problem. You don't have an SLA, so you have no one to, if you're offering SLAs to your clients, it's difficult when you're reliant on a service which um, you don't have any SLA with. So, like I said, our deployments depended on NPM, and Another problem we had is some of our code needs to be private, so we could have tackled that by putting our projects into Git, and then you can use NPM to reference Git uh, projects. That works well, but that pro causes problems with NPM update. It doesn't, the versioning doesn't work, so it, you go back to your RM type and RF node modules. So a solution needed to be found, and I think really it's essential for any team developing uh, node for, for enterprise organizations and that is to set up a private npm repo we've got a blog post on our on our site which talks about um, which talks about how you can set up your own npm repo and also i think nojitsu and a few others are providing um, supported npm repos which you can go and use so I shouldn't have touched it. Okay, so so you can set up your um, so if you have a, if you have a private npm repo, you can set it up to be your global uh, npm repo like this, or you can call it on a per npm command uh, just hyphen hyphen <coughs> registry. So you can set your 
global, so all operations now, if you, set a, if you have a private repo, will be using that repo. Now you have to remember, if you're going to start doing this approach, in your NPM uh, package JSON, you need to specify where you want your, publishes, your packages to be published. Uh, you, you can manually do it, but to avoid the risk of some private code going public, uh, there's a public config uh, directive or, or property, which by doing that means that it will only ever be pushed into that registry. And this is for your private, and likewise for anything that you want public. If you've always got your uh, private uh, NPM repo set up as your default, it's probably not a bad idea to start putting in your public NPM packages that they should go into the public repository, because although they, they will get um, you know, duplicated and uh, replicated onto the, your private repo, uh, you will still want to push them upstream to the main NPM registry so that everybody else can get them. Um, so, Subjoy, I think the best thing probably that's come out of our going to Node is um, how our front-end and our back-end teams have become much more unified. And again, uh, this, this is probably down to Browserify and the way that we've changed how we develop JavaScript applications by developing them almost exactly the same way we develop Node, uh, our back-end applications. Um, we, using Browserify, we were able to render the same templates and uh, use the same schemas and the same NPM modules that we use in the back end. You do have to be careful not to do uh, some operations, but broadly speaking, a lot of the little utility functions and certainly the data, the data schemas, we can share between layers very easy. And that wasn't really, we weren't too sure if that was going to be possible. We didn't think that dream of sharing code between the two layers was necessarily possible, but it turns out it is. Uh, one other big thing which you have to factor into your development, and you've come from PHP, you have no, you, this isn't really a concern, or almost, almost never a concern, but memory leaks, you have to factor them into your uh, project delivery, you will definitely encounter them, and if you factor them in and expect them and look for them, uh, it makes life a lot easier. To, for memory leaks, the best thing to do is to learn the tools, dtrace, and um, also you can now use Manta to just put your application up onto the Manta service and run your application there. It's fully loaded with lots of goodies and it means you can run Dtrace to try and find some of your uh, memory leaks. It's heap dump, so if you want to look for memory leaks before you uh, deploy your application, because post-mortem in memory leaks is painful, it's much better to try and uh, find them while you're developing and get the development team to look for them. So using tools like this can help you. And just always assume there are memory leaks. There will, when picking, um, when picking uh, packages to use, I'm not going to switch out, uh, you'll always see that uh, you, we had to try five or six different terms, uh, stream uh, processes that had all had memory leaks. It, it just, this has to be assumed. So you need to try a module, see if it leaks. Um, monitor your memory as well. So if you, run, if you have long running processes on your servers, make sure that the memory is monitored. For, if anyone uses Mongo, Mongo Native Driver has had a memory leak in for ages and all of our servers have always just, you've just seen them, the little sawtooth is just constantly going up at a very slow rates and you see it and you think this is painful. So making sure your application restarts, but the only solution we had there was to, we had to do nightly restarts because we knew that there was a memory leak, we knew that it was in Mongo Driver, but we just weren't, um, we just didn't have the resources to fix it. So you have to kind of sometimes bite the bullet, and if, you, if, you, if there is a memory leak, if it's a very small one, which it was in this case, you can um, mitigate it somewhat by um, restarting your application. But I think Mongo particularly has now fixed that, and that, that, that's now meant that we have constant memory usage across all of our applications, which is a big relief. So, uh, three years on, is Node any good? For us, um, there are still some things that we've not got right. We haven't got our deployment right, so it's, it's okay, but it could be better. And maybe Julian's talk will you know, enlighten us a bit and uh, give us some ideas of how we can improve our deployment. 
We had CI before, with Node, we're still not in place with CI, and that's basically because I don't want to go back to using Jenkins. Jenkins doesn't feel like the right thing to have within your stack. It's a very horrible, big Java-like thing. <coughs> it feels like there should be a really nice, small, lightweight Node.js uh, CI with powered by level DB or something, something that you can just run, set up, and have CI running. So I've got some ideas about it. I've, we've got to get it solved in the next six months, probably. So anyone's tackled this problem or wants to work on something, uh, we definitely put some resource into making a really good, lightweight, um, no JS CI environment. We do, uh, it said that, that said, we do use Travis CI for our public repos, and that works really well. I can't, uh, I can't really fault that. For our deployment, build, and CI uh, QA uh, environment, though, it doesn't, I've looked at the private plans, and it doesn't quite fit the developer workflow that we want, so that's why we're still looking. Um, so, <laughs> Node definitely has united our back-end and front-end. That's probably the biggest thing. We've got much less fraction in our team. We used to have front-end developers, back-end developers. We just now have developers. Um, and for our use case, which is to build websites which um, integrate with web services and other websites, Node.js is perfect. It couldn't, we couldn't have asked for a better language. Um, and it's certainly the most exciting technology that I've ever worked in. And I know that my team feel this way as well. When we come to work, we really enjoy working with Node.js. And it's been great watching the language grow up. So many of you have been using Node for a while. It's really been had its guts laid bare. And we've all been able to watch how it's grown, the decisions and the conflicts and the way things have changed. Um, that's been an exciting experience, something you know uh, I've never experienced before. So our business. In the last three years has been tremendously successful. That's not necessarily down to Node.js, but I think Node.js plays a really big part in that. So, if, if, is Node any good? Yep, I think so. I think it rocks. Thank you.